First off, I want to say I'm really, I was really thrilled when Bob called and uh, asked if I wanted to come talk to this group. Uh, I do give a lot of these talks, but I'm really, really psyched about being here because I want to start off by saying that I think as a whole, you people have um, some of the best opportunity to really make a positive impact on wildlife, more so than many people have, so it's really uh, a privilege to be able to be here. Um, it's also very timely to be here today. I, I didn't anticipate this, and I not can't say I'm happy about it, but over the past few days, maybe you all have seen, because a lot of news sources have picked up reporting about a study that came out of the Cornell Ornithological Laboratory, which is really just about the most respected ornithological uh, organization there is, that said that in the past 50 years, uh, the number of birds in North America has declined by 29%. Now, they're not talking about species, they're talking about individuals, but that's 50 years. And we're going to talk about climate change today, but I want to point out that that 30% drop, very little of that has to do with climate change. Climate change, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is an exponentially growing phenomenon. And so if you look between 1970 and now, you haven't really, you know, we're just now getting to this part. And so that's... A uh, 30% drop in bird numbers is mostly been due to habitat loss and also decrease in insect populations that they need uh, to eat and survive. So uh, we've got that, and unfortunately what I'm going to tell you about is that we have more problems coming when it comes to birds. So um, I'm going to have a lot of grim things to say. But I'm going to end by uh, uh, trying to give you suggestions about things you might consider doing, practices you might consider implementing that would benefit the birds on your property, on your tree farm. So we'll talk a little bit about birds. We'll talk about why you should care about birds. Why does it matter that there are birds uh, in your forest? Um, then we'll talk about the effects of climate change on birds and then what you might be able to do about it. Okay, we'll start off here. Washington forests are home to approximately 130 species of birds. Um, that's my count, and I probably missed a few, so it's, uh, it's probably somewhat more than that. Um, unless you have an incredibly unusual piece of land, uh, you're not going to have all 130 uh, where you live. But I only own an acre of land, and I have 42, uh, so uh, you might have more species than you, than you know about. Okay, now the reason you don't have all 130 some odd species on your property is that although some birds are generalists, think American robin, think Canada geese, you know, they are the, the cockroaches of the bird world. They can live anywhere. You, you can't get rid of them. Most birds are rather specialized. And so they go to very particular habitats. And I've just got some examples of that. Uh, so what we have here um, is an acorn woodpecker, uh, as, as the name implies, they like oak trees, they, they live largely on acorns, and so you'd find them if you had a lot of oak trees on your property. On the other hand, one of my favorite little birds um, is a chestnut-backed chickadee. It is a Pacific Northwest specialty, and um, it basically likes conifers. It loves dug firs, so you rarely find these two birds together. Similarly, I can never say that word, though these two birds look almost exactly alike in these pictures. The one on the right is twice the size of the one on the left. The one on the left is a downy woodpecker, and they tend to like very young growth trees. They like saplings and very small trees. You can see it's on a tree not much bigger, not much wider than it is. On the other hand, hairy woodpeckers on the right there um, like mature trees, and so you don't find them. I mean, there's some overlap, but you generally don't find them in the same place. Hint, hint, I'm going to tell you for bird diversity, have lots of different size trees. Um, here's another example. Uh, birds also tend to prefer particular la uh, altitudes. And so uh, here on the coast, uh, Stellar's jays, you can find Stellar's jays further inland, they go up to higher altitudes. On the other hand, Canada gray jays, um, in order to find them around here, you have to basically climb Rainier a little bit. Uh, they only stay in high altitudes. Ah, one more. Okay. Uh, another difference uh, in the kind of habitat that birds care about is, uh, is how much water is available to them. So on the left is the aptly named wood duck because they live almost exclusively on ponds and streams in pretty thick woods. 
uh, and that's where you find them. They need a lot of water. On the other hand, the common poor will uh, also lives uh, in forests, but it likes it dry and dusty, so you don't find them in the same place. Now, one more slide uh, in, in this venue. Most of these birds, you may or may not know them, but they look like the kind of birds you expect to find in forests. What I want to tell you is that there are some birds that you have in your forest, or you may have in your forest, that are not the kind of birds that you'd really ever expect to find in a forest. And my favorite example of that is this little guy here. He's called a marbled murrelet. And he's what uh, we term a pelagic bird. And a pelagic bird is a bird that spends its life out at sea. This bird uh, doesn't come on to land except to breed. So for 10 months a year, it never touches land. And until about 10 years ago, nobody had ever seen a marbled murrelet nest. No one had ever found one. And then about 10 years ago, somebody did. And they discovered that the reason they never found one is they were looking in the wrong place. Because these guys fly up to 50 miles into dense old growth forests like you find on the Olympic Peninsula. And they put their nests on the top of these enormous, gigantic uh, coniferous trees. Um, and so there are just lots and lots and lots of birds that rely on forests. They are only there two months a year, but without those two months, they don't lay any eggs successfully. Okay, so there we go. I want to talk to you about why birds matter, um, because, you know, I'm a crazy bird lady. I love birds, but not everybody does. Um, so why should you care whether or not you have healthy bird populations in your forest? And the answer is birds are, are they're a part of the ecosystem, but they provide real services to other plant to plants and other animals. So, kind of going from to me least important to more important, they pollinate. There are 7,000 species of plants across the world that are pollinated by birds, including many that have commercial interests uh, for human beings. If you like bananas, if you like mangoes, if you like nutmeg, thank a bird. Um, because they are, they're the, the animals doing the pollination. Now, to be honest, in our area, this is not very important. Very few plants in the Pacific Northwest are pollinated by birds. There are few, but not too many. But, but on a global basis, this is, uh, you know, an important function that birds serve. Oh, I should tell you, by the way, uh, I've populated my slides with lots and lots of different examples of birds. All but one live in Washington. Uh, and all but another one live in Washington forests. So these are all forest birds you're looking at. And if you do end up looking at my PowerPoint once once you put it out, I will have the name of each bird on the slide so you can see what they are if you're interested. Rufus Hummer. Um, anyway, second function is that they disperse seeds. And this is one you can probably relate to more. So when, again, I think of more broadly birds dispersing seeds, the most important uh, plants that they disperse seeds for are wetland plants, estuary plants. Almost 90% of wetland plants in the state of Washington use birds as their uh, mode of seed dispersal. Uh, they don't rely on insects. They don't rely on, on wind. They rely on plants, uh, excuse me, on birds. Um, but even think, uh, you know, when you think of trees, if an oak tree, you know better than I, produces, you know, 100,000 acorns or whatever it does, imagine they all fall straight to the ground. How many of those acorns are going to take root and flourish? The reason plants evolved berries and fruits and nuts was to encourage birds and to a lesser extent mammals to eat them, have the food, have the fruit or, or nut pass through their digestive system and then be <clears throat> pooped out somewhere else. Birds can travel, birds can fly, most birds fly 30 to 60 miles an hour. And given that it takes usually about a day, for the uh, seed to pass through their system. It depends upon the seed, depends upon the wood. We're talking hundreds of miles, a circle of hundreds of miles radius that they can disperse seeds. And so uh, it's a real service to the plants that they do so. It's so important to, to a lot of plants that these plants have actually evolved seeds that won't germinate unless they've passed through a bird's gut. They've got very tough outer shells that if it isn't eaten away by acid, They'll just lie on the ground and not uh, never germinate. So this is a very, very important function for birds. To me, though, the most important use uh, of birds, most important benefit of birds for plants is the next one. 
They eat plant predators. And most birds eat plant predators, which are insects, slugs, things like that. In fact, even birds you think of as seed eaters, because they come to your feeders and they eat your sunflower seeds or your thistle, during the breeding season, 90% of their diet is insects. So um, there are some birds that only eat insects, but there are even the seed eaters in the summer heavily eat insects. I could go on and on about the data and how we know how important this insect predation is for plants, but I'll start with my most dramatic and favorite example, then I'll go more to trees. Some of you may be old enough to remember this. In 1958, Mao Zedong, old dictator of China, um, declared a war on the four pests. That's what he called it. The four pests were flies, mosquitoes, rats, and sparrows. And the reason he put sparrows in there is he thought that they were eating too much rice and, and too much wheat and that, you know, contributing to uh, hunger in China. So he ordered everyone in China to kill every sparrow that they saw. And it took them between one and two years to do so. And after about a year and a half, there were essentially no sparrows in China. In 1960, the Great Famine occurred. 30 million people died in 1960 to 1961 because there was no food in China. And the reason there was no food is grasshoppers and locusts ate all of it. And I can't say it's 100% because of the lack of sparrows, but believe me, a really big contributor to that famine was because the sparrows weren't there. When the sparrows came back, when they decided to stop having them killed, and over time the population grew, uh, their, their harvests really increased in size. There have been studies in the Pacific Northwest that look at, I mean, I'm saying this because a lot, I'm, sometimes when I talk to people uh, about birds and plants, they, they think that birds predate plants. They think that birds are hurting plants. And I won't say there's no harm to plants, but the good that they do far, far, far exceeds it. So, for example, there was a study that just came out within the past few months that directly looked at, um, and I think this was a cherry orchard. So you're talking about a, 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 a tree that's particularly vulnerable to birds doing damage. I mean, birds eating your crop. I mean, birds eat cherries. What they found was that um, if you had a lot of birds present, insect damage went down by 12%. The birds themselves were responsible for 2% of damage. So there was actually a 10% net for having a lot of birds around, even though, yes, they were eating a few of the cherries. The bugs were eating a lot more. Anyway, estimates are that you can uh, uh, save hundreds of dollars per acre in damage uh, in tree farms if you uh, have a healthy bird population to help keep nasty insects down. So this is, you know, this is really, really important. That's plants, animals, they, they're needed for the ecosystem in general, and so another important function birds serve is they are, they and their eggs are food for other animals, and often important food sources for other animals. And then last, but to me not least, gee, they're damn pretty, uh, some of them, and they really do, uh, you know, make, make our environment nicer than it otherwise would be. And they're beautiful to look at, some of them, and some of them have beautiful songs that contribute to. All right. To what extent are birds being affected by climate change? This is my bird that is a Washington bird, but not a forest bird. Um, it's a burrowing owl. They're all over the eastern half of the state, uh, out in grasslands. Uh, so to what extent are birds being affected by climate change? Well, according to David Yarnold, who's the president of the National Audubon Society and should know, nearly half of our birds are at risk of extinction from climate change this century. That doesn't have to happen. He said both those things, and they're both right. And I'm going to tell you how we know this. Um, in fact, the official position of the Audubon Society is that climate change has now surpassed both habitat loss and insect loss, as loss, and they haven't gone away, as the leading threat to birds. I mean, this, this is an overlay to what's already been happening, and we've already lost roughly 30% of the birds in North America. So this is this is not good news. 
So um, how is climate change affecting birds? Um, how will it? First, just generally, and then we'll talk about the mechanisms. Well, one thing is, is that it's causing massive displacement. Birds are moving. They're, they're not where they used to be. Birds have an advantage over most other animals, and that is they fly 30 to 60 miles an hour. And, you know, some of them can fly 10 days without ever stopping. Uh, the long-distance uh, migrants can fly 10 days uh, without stopping. So, I mean, they can go far. So if they're not happy where they are, they up and move. And so the first thing you see um, is massive displace, uh, displacement. And, and, and as I'll talk about more later, this is not theory. This is, in fact, already happening, measurably happening. The other thing which has not happened yet, but we expect to have happen, unfortunately, is mass extinction. All the predictions are. Anything I've ever read on the subject says that there will be mass extinctions of birds. Okay, let me tell you uh, about what I believe to be, the, and is generally considered, the single best study on climate change in birds. And, you know, the problem with speaking in the afternoon when you don't know the people speaking in the morning is you don't know what they're going to say. So I'm going to skip over some of this because you've already heard it, um, probably twice. But let me tell you about the cogent parts of this study. Anyway, uh, the, 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 the birds and climate change study took seven years to do, um, and it looked at how climate change will affect the ranges of 588 species of North American birds. There are 800 species of birds, more or less, in North America. So why these 588? The reason why is those are the ones we have enough data on to be able to say something. So every single bird uh, species that we had enough data on was studied. Okay? So that's pretty good. And um, it's kind of a three-part Three parts to this. The first thing you have to do is you have to establish a climate range for birds. And the way this was done was, again, kind of two pieces. The first is crazy people like me, and we're always looking for more volunteers if anybody wants to help. Um, twice a year, we go out from dawn to dusk in set places that we're assigned, and we count all the birds we can see. This is usually not fun in December, but we do it anyway. So we have um, a December bird count, winter range, and we have a summer bird count, uh, a breeding bird count, which is the summer range. And this has been going on for 30 years all over the U.S. and Canada. It is in science at its best. So there's a huge amount of data. You know, this is where these birds are. Now, so that's how you know where the birds are. Remember this? People have been showing this. A good way to think about this is when you look at, if I know this is we have never seen an eastern bluebird in a place that gets colder than 15 degrees or a place that gets hotter than 86 degrees. We can say that's its hardiness zone. That, that's what it needs in order, in order to live just like plant hardiness zones, which everybody's familiar with. It's the same sort of thing. Leaving everything aside, and I mean, a good, the reason, part of the reason this is a good analogy is the fact that you're in the right hardiness zone doesn't guarantee the animal can survive. It's what's minimally necessary, right? I mean, you're never going to get a palm tree to live in Maine, but I could plant a dug fir in my yard, which that's appropriate climately, but if I don't water it, you know, it, it, it's not going to, it doesn't get enough, it gets too much sun, whatever, it's not going to survive. So um, I just wanted to show you, and I'm, I'm now embarrassed that there's a 2012 uh, map, because I was going to show you this map, and since I'm from Ohio, why don't you look at Ohio? This is 1990. In Ohio, it was two-thirds blue and a little bit of dark green. If you go over to Illinois, just because it's another easy one to see, it's a third purple, a third blue, and a third green. This is the 2006 hardiness zone. I haven't updated this. Now I know I should. So that's only 16 years. And look at the difference. Ohio is now entirely green, no longer two-thirds blue. And uh, purple has pretty much left Illinois. It's now half blue. Third, a quarter dark green and a quarter light green. So in just 16 years, you know, and, and, and these people had no political agenda. They weren't trying to prove a point. They were just telling people what to grow, you know, uh, trying to help help gardeners. So you can see that, that uh, this is really beginning to happen. But anyway, if we know what the temperature ranges are in different places and we know where the birds live and do not live, you can say... This is the bird's hardiness zone. And so they, they developed that. That was step one. 
Oh, and I should say they didn't just look at temperature, they also looked at precipitation, and they looked at it every which way but sideways. I mean, it's the hottest month in the summer, the coldest it gets in the summer, the hottest it gets in the winter, the coldest it gets in the winter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. same for precipitation, averages, extremes, whatever. They mapped this out. Then what they did, but they didn't really do it, they stole from other people, is they estimated climate change. They looked at uh, internationally accepted models of climate change, and they predicted future climate zones in 2020. This study is now about five years old, so that was the future back then, 2050 and 2080. And they actually did it with three different levels of optimism. They repeated the study three <coughs> times with, uh, you know, assuming that we've done more to curb carbon emissions, you know, or less. Uh, and so they had three different levels of climate change. And in each of the levels of climate change, the world gets hotter, it gets hotter, uh, more hot, relatively more hotter, um, the more carbon there is in the atmosphere. And then um, what they did is they put it together and they created these maps, which is really nice because it's very clear. Anyway, blue is winter range, yellow is summer range. The darker the color, the more suited it is to a given bird species. And I just thought I'd show you three bird species uh, that are forest-dwelling Washington birds. I picked them at random because I like them, not because they were the most extreme. I could have found much more extreme examples had I tried, but these are just three random ones for me. So here's a bird called the varied thrush. It is a Pacific Coast specialty. You only find it from Northern California up through Alaska, uh, right along the coast. And in 2000, here was their climate-sensitive range. So you can see eastern Washington, they're good as gold all year round in eastern Washington, really good winter habitat. Here's the prediction for 2080. You can see they basically are going to be gone from eastern Washington, and they will only be in, uh, in eastern Washington. They'll, they'll only be in western Washington um, in the winter. Here's another one, the red crossbill. Uh, red crossbills are another uh, northwest specialty. Their bills are funny like that because what they live on um, is a uh, uh, conifer cone, especially Doug fir cone. Uh, I always want to say pine cones, and I know that's wrong. That's what I grew up saying. Anyway, they use their cross bill to, to kind of push, open them up so they can get the seeds. Okay, so that's what they use them for. So that's why they've got that funny mouth. Um, anyway, you can see that in 2000, most of the state of Washington was good habitat for them. They were here year-round. Not so much in 2080. And my third example is a Wilson's warbler. Uh, I happen to like Wilson's warblers. Um, they're only in the western part uh, of Washington, but they're very, 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 very common here. You've probably heard them and not known it. They go which when you're walking. Um, in 2008, they're going to largely be gone. And that is the story over and over and over and over again ad nauseum. Um, anyway, the upshot of the study is that, again, uh, they looked at 588 species, 314 of them, which is just over 50%, are expected to lose at least half of either their summer or their winter range, or both, by the year 2080. And half of those, meaning 25% of all of our species, will do so by the year 2050, which isn't very far away anymore. Okay. So uh, birds really are climate threatened. There's no doubt about it. Now, to bring it closer to home, um, there are about 180, about 400 species of birds in Washington. No, 450 species of birds in Washington. Um, 189 species in Washington State uh, are at climate risk. Um, I told you there were 130 species of birds by my count, uh, forest birds in Washington. I counted 70 of them, so a little bit more than half again, 70 out of 130 uh, at risk of losing half or more of one of their ranges. Okay, now, to make this even worse, as a, an earlier speaker was saying, you know, this model just looks at climate. It didn't take anything else into account. And when you start taking other things into account, it gets worse and worse because they didn't take habitat loss into account. And one thing that's going to happen if the climate changes is there's going to be habitat loss. Those trees aren't going to be able to survive the droughts. They didn't, they didn't factor that in. 
They didn't factor in sea level rise. Not so important for forest birds, but believe me, for shorebirds and wetland birds, you know, I mean, I mean, imagine a, a wetland that backs onto a cliff. A lot of wetlands like that around where I live. Um, if the sea level rises two feet, there's no more wetland, and it didn't just back up because it hits a cliff. So there's just no habitat anymore. So they didn't take sea level rise into account. Uh, they didn't look at the effects of uh, climate change on migration routes. That's something I'm going to come back to in a minute, so I'm not going to talk about that now. Um, and they didn't look at effects of breeding timing, uh, which climate change is going to muck up. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But So anyway, at least half of our birds are at risk of, uh, if not extinction, um, certainly uh, massive decreases in number over the next you know, 60 years now. I'm not even going to talk about how our area's climate will change because we already heard about that. Um, okay, so now I've tried to give you a sense of the scope of how climate change is going to affect birds. Let's look at the mechanism. Why is climate change going to affect birds? And most of it are indirect effects. And again, you've heard a bunch of this before, and I know you're going to hear more later. Because it's not that the birds can't stand 91 degree weather. They're not going to die of heat stroke. And it's not that they can't, st I mean, sometimes you can, there are some birds that can't stand cold temperatures. Birds are actually very tolerant of cold temperatures. It's, it's not the temperature itself that's going to kill them. What's going to kill them are indirect effects because of other things that are changed because of the climate. So how will climate change affect birds? Um, okay, so I've broken it up into, I think it's six six kind of major avenues. So the first is climate change causing habitat loss. Uh, that's White Pass after a forest fire a few years ago. Not much left. Um, anyway, one way there's going to be habitat loss because of climate change um, is, again, uh, plants are going to be out. The plants that they're used to eating, that they need, that they're adapted to, to, to live on and eat, um, are going to become outside their climate envelope and are not going to be there anymore. Um, I experienced this myself a little bit. I lived in Ohio most of my adult life, and we had um, some pine trees. I do not know the species on my block. The whole block was lined in these pine trees. I lived in Ohio for almost 30 years um, on this same block, and these were big trees. They were all dead by the time I left. And the answer given was that between somewhat hotter summers and drier summers, they just couldn't do it anymore. And little by little by little, they all died. Um, so sea level rise due to melting glaciers. Again, wetland birds more than forest birds, but I, this is a major factor, so I did want to mention it. Um, increased survival of invasive plant species. This is a glossy buckthorn. Um, just like trees are very, very well adapted to the specific environment that they've been living in, so are birds. The nutrients they get, their digestive systems, the kind of nests they want to build are suited to, to a very particular habitat. And you just can't substitute one plant for another. Now, maybe some birds can eat glossy buckthorn. They probably can. But it's not quite the same as salmonberry and thimbleberry or elderberry or whatever else they're eating. And, you know, it, it, there's going to be a mismatch. Plus, these invasive species that come in tend to take over. I mean, think about Himalayan blackberry. Think about Scott's broom. Um, and then, then you've got a monoculture. And whenever you have only one type of plant, you don't have the variety uh, that birds need uh, to do well. So you've got increased survival um, of invasive plant species, invasive insect species as well. Um, and again, I know someone's, someone's going to be talking about insects, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But um, there are a lot of nasty insects a number of nasty insects that whose numbers are kept in check, have been kept in check, because it gets just cold enough in the winter that many of them don't survive. And even just a few degrees of temperature mean that they're not dying off the way they used to. Um, and that, again, is going to change the habitat. The trees are going to die. The plants are going to die. Um, here's a picture from British Columbia. Uh, which has a, this, this part of British Columbia has a bark beetle invasion, and you can see 
And I've seen worse than this. When I was in Alaska five years ago, I was hunting for great gray owls. When I was tre trekking through the forest in, in Alaska, I crested a hill. And I was with uh, the man who owned the property I was on. And when I crested the hill, I am not exaggerating when I tell you that as far as I could see, there was not a single living tree. It was all dead. They were sick as bruises. Um, and I, I looked at him and I said, what happened? It doesn't look like there was a fire. I mean, they don't look charred or anything. He said, we've got a bark beetle. We've always had some loss, but it's gotten worse and worse. And finally, here we are. <laughs> um, so I really understand this at a really gut level. Um, forest fires. With climate change and increased drought in the summers, um, we're, we're going to have more and more forest fires. If for no other reason than a longer, hotter, drier summer means there's a longer season. So even if they didn't increase in relative frequency, you've got more, more months to worry about, more weeks to worry about. The fact that it will be more arid, uh, you know, makes things more prone to burn. Insect infestation. Um, when you've already weakened a tree, it may have survived the charring if it hadn't been weakened, but since it's half dead to begin with, now that's going to take them down. Um, and lightning. Uh, I don't know if, I don't remember if anybody mentioned this, but predictions are uh, that lightning strikes in the West are going to go up something on the order of 15% uh, over the not too distant future, and lightning is a major cause of forest fires. So um, however you look at it, there are going to be more forest fires, larger forest fires, and that takes away the bird's habitat. Okay, so that's habitat loss. How else does climate change affect birds? Um, I kind of lumped two things together here. Increased parasitism by insects uh, attacking birds and then the diseases that they give to the birds. Uh, this is, I have, this is actually, actually I lied, this is a second bird, not not from Washington State. This is a Hawaiian bird because Hawaii is feeling these effects more than any other state at this point. Uh, this, this is a big problem uh, in Hawaii right now. But anyway, um, with warmer temperatures, insects tend to be more active. They move, you know, they're, they're cold-blooded. They, you know, they're bags of chemical reactions. The warmer it is, the faster they move. So they're more active. They're more prone to bite. They breed more quickly. The breeding cycles speed up. And as I just talked about, less insect die-off. So with climate change, insects become more of a problem. Um, and insects do attack birds. Going around from the up, uh, clockwise from the upper left corner, you've got mosquitoes, you've got mites. In fact, that baby bird died from all of its mite bites. Um, lice and then ticks. And so more active insects leads to more bird disease, and a number of those birds will die. And birds can definitely get insect uh, diseases from insects, just to name three. They get rabbit fever. They can get malaria, not to not carry it, but get it themselves. And West Nile fever. Um, that one, again, I can speak about personally. I keep saying I used to live in Ohio. Um, you all know how common crows are. Well, in the Midwest, they're as common. Okay, I mean, crows are really common birds. Except for 10 years, they weren't, because the crows in Ohio got West Nile fever, and we went for about 10 years where you didn't see a crow, you know? I mean, you could go months without seeing a crow. <laughs> Think about that. Think about how many crows there are. Um, and they were just gone. Now, not everybody mourns crows, but um, but uh, we people who love birds did. So anyway, they, they, they can get these diseases. So that's a second mechanism by which climate change will negatively affect birds. This one's a really important one. Uh, migration. For, uh, well, to put it in perspective, 40%, uh, just about 40% of bird species migrate. So not all birds migrate, but uh, definitely a significant number do. So if climate change is going to disrupt migration, that's going to affect a lot of different birds. Um, I don't know why I stick this one in here, but when I say migration, I think two things. I know most of you are only thinking one thing, so I wanted to point that out. When, when you hear the word migration, what most people imagine uh, is what these snow geese are de doing on the left there. I called it classic migration, which is you fly uh, south in the winter, if you're a northern hemisphere bird, and north in the summer. Okay, So you're talking about latitude change. There's another type of migration that a lot of birds do called vertical migration. Um, these harlequin ducks are a good example of that. 
Um, what these birds do is in the winter, they live on the coast. You can go see them at, uh, oh, anywhere you go to the coast around here, you can see them. But what's, Alki Beach. Okay, they're always at Alki Beach. You can see them in the winter. In the summer, what they do is they go up Rainier <laughs> and up the Cascades. Uh, so they escape the heat not by flying to a different area, but by going up a mountainside. Both types of, mi uh, of migration are uh, affected by climate change. This is really hard to talk about, and I don't have time to do it in uh, really great depth because it's, it's very complicated. Um, different bird species have reacted. Uh, their migration patterns have changed, we believe, because of climate change. Uh, but, but it's different depending upon the bird. Uh, in some cases, birds that always used to migrate, none of them migrate anymore, or large numbers of them just stop migrating. This is particularly true of European birds. Uh, most European birds used to spend their winters in Africa, and that is no longer true. Uh, a large number, I think more than half now, of birds that used to migrate in Europe are now staying in Europe all year round. So um, sometimes it's completely eliminated. I'll talk about why this is probably the case in a minute. Um, it's reduced it. If you're talking about going south, it's hotter. They, want, they don't want to be hot, so they don't go as far south. Um, and it's increased it during the times of year that they go north. Uh, now they're going further north to try to stay cool. Um, definitely changed the timing of it, and I'll come back to that later. And it's destroyed stopover points. I don't know if you know this, but most birds, when they migrate, they're, they don't fly just anywhere. There, there are certain pathways. We call them highways. And along the highways, just like our highways have rest stops, their highways have rest stops. And I don't know if you've ever been on the road, like I just was at Oregon, where five rest stops at a row were closed. But, you know, you get desperate after a while. I mean, you can't just stop anywhere to have your needs met. There are only certain places that you could stop. And if they're not there or they're closed, you know, you're, you're just kind of wit's end. So um, when birds migrate, usually there are very set stopover points that are really pretty small. We're talking city blocks or a couple of city blocks. If something happens to those stopover points, like, for example, they disappear because the sea level has risen, the birds don't have anywhere else to go and often end up starving. So um, that's another way uh, that migration has been affected. Um, now, I know some people are skeptical of projections, and rightly so, because you know projections are only as good as the data you have. So I want to take a minute now and talk about this is not a projection, just like the 30% of you know numbers of birds are down. Not a projection, it actually happens. Um, in 2009, Audubon did a study looking at about 300 species of birds, simply saying, um, since 1970, um, how has the center of their population changed? You know, if you just kind of say, here's where, the, here's where the birds live, here's kind of the center of that. How has that changed? And what we found is that many, 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 many species um, have already significantly moved north. This is actually a better picture. This is kind of the extreme ones. But you can see that there are a lot of birds that already have moved 200 plus miles north uh, of where they used to be found. Birds are moving. There's no doubt about it. Um, there's the very thrush I talked about before. It used to the center of population used to be down here at uh, the Washington Oregon border. Now it's at the Canadian border. Um, so you know. <laughs> They're definitely all, they've already moved. This isn't just projection. Here are two local birds um, that I happen to have specific numbers on. So red-breasted mergansers, type of duck. They've, in 2009, they had already moved over 300 miles north. Pine siskins, very common in coniferous forests, had already moved 280 miles north. So again, this is not projection. This is, it's happened. Um, so we know it's happening. Okay. Um, Stopover points. Uh, I was talking about European birds have stopped. Many of them have stopped migrating. And no one knows for sure. This could just be coincidence. But part of the reason they're certainly having trouble when they do migrate, which is maybe why they've stopped migrating, is they used to all... It's a far way from Sweden to, uh, you know, the green belt in Africa. 
And so what European birds would do is they would get it about this far, and then they would rest up a bit and get some water to drink, and then they'd continue. This area of land is called the Sahil, and the Sahil um, is quite arid, but it's not as arid as the Sahara. I mean, there are bodies of water, and there are grasses to eat and seeds to eat. The Sahel is disappearing. <laughs> it's shrinking. It's turning into the Sahara. Um, and so the birds that do migrate, even the ones that are still migrating, are having problems because they get to the, their usual uh, watering spots and feeding spots, and it's dried up. Um, and some people think at least that, well, we know that's happening, but that the reason some birds are now not migrating is not just that it's warmer in Europe, but that they've somehow figured out that this is a really tough migration that they used to do uh, without any trouble. Okay. Ah, I just want indulging myself. I don't know if any of you have ever watched bird migrations. It's really with falls coming up. This is the time, one of the times of year you can see it. Um, this is a picture of snow geese I took in Snohomish County, trying to give you some idea of the density of birds you can see and how they congregate uh, in their resting stops. So these are snow geese in Snohomish County. Here we've got sandhill cranes um, near Othello. Go to the Othello Crane Festival. It's great. Um, there's a picture of western sandpipers that um, I took in Grays Harbor. And here we've got on Bottle Beach a mixed flock of shorebirds. But this is the kind of density and compactness you get when birds migrate and then they, they stop at their resting spot. So it really is a sight to see. Anyway, climate change also leads to decreased food supply, partly because of habitat loss. But what I wanted to, uh, to talk about here briefly, though I know this isn't as relevant for forests, it's important overall, um, is that as the world gets, as the air gets warmer, so does the ocean. The ocean is actually, in fact, getting warmer faster than the, the air is. Um, and what happens, we now know, when the ocean temperature increases, is that you, okay, we start with forage fish. Forage fish are tiny little fish that are kind of at the bottom or near the bottom of the food chain, that bigger fish eat and birds eat. And, you know, uh, so they're very, very important. But but when you've got cold water, there are certain species of forage fish that flourish, and they tend to be fish that are very high fat content. Salmon is not a forage fish, but think about forage fish, but think about how fatty salmon is. Um, as the water gets warmer, these fatty species get replaced by different fish that are the same size, but there's fewer calories per bite. Okay? Good for dieting, not good for survival. And so birds that rely on forage fish, um, like this puffin, um, well, let me back up a minute. Birds have incredibly fast metabolisms, much faster than mammals' metabolism. If you think running, running's hard and takes a lot of energy, think about flying at 60 miles an hour. They also can fly up to 25,000 feet, some birds. Uh, I mean, they need a lot of energy to do this. And so they eat all the time. Well, so now imagine that they're still eating all the time, but it's got half the calories that it used to have. They end up starving. And that's beginning to happen. So a changeover in the nature of the forage fish has uh, not been good for bird populations. Also, uh, warmer oceans uh, with more carbon dioxide dissolved means, just like we used to talk about acid rain, now we talk about ocean acidification. Uh, uh, clams and oysters and crabs, their shells are basically made of calcium. Uh, materials, limestone, and you put them in an acid environment and they don't do so well. Uh, and there are a lot of birds, there are a lot of larger fish that rely on shellfish to survive when the shellfish don't do well because of climate change, neither do the birds or these larger fish and then the birds that depend upon the larger fish. Similarly, there are effects on freshwater, not just the ocean. Um, algae, algae blooms um, uh, proliferate in warmer water temperatures, as an example. Um, also, I think it's already been mentioned, salmon have a lot of trouble breeding uh, in warm water, and uh, that's bad because we love salmon, and it's bad for the birds, like bald eagles, that feed on salmon. So climate change leads to food uh, deficits. Um, 
just to point out, this is something that hasn't been well studied yet, and, but it's beginning to get more press now and, and, and more attention. Um, people thought for a while, we're always looking for the bright spot. People thought for a while, okay, good, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plants need carbon dioxide to grow. Plants grow faster when you give them a lot of carbon dioxide. This is great. We're going to make up some of these problems because plants are going to grow faster and we're all going to be able to have more food. The problem is, is when plants grow faster, you can double the size of an apple. It has the same amount of protein <laughs> that it had before you doubled it in size. The, the, the excess size is largely carbohydrates, uh, which is some calories, but, but you're not increasing the nutrition proportionally. Again, remember, birds stuff themselves all the time. It's not like, well, I'll just eat another one. I've already eaten my fill, but I don't have the nutrition I used to have. They're worried about this for people, too, by the way. This is now something they're concerned about, that, you know, a leaf of spinach isn't going to have the nutrition that it used to have. Um, climate change and timing of breeding. Uh, I'll make this really short. Well, birds have moved up their time of breeding on average about a week per decade for the last 40 decades, uh, four decades, last 40 years. So birds are breeding now about a month earlier than they were 40 years ago. Um, everybody believes that this is climate related. The problem with that is that, again, it's, you know, the ecosystem is a delicately balanced mechanism. The reason birds breed when they do is to catch peak insect availability because most birds feed their young insects. Um, the problem is, is now there's a mismatch in timing between the birds and the insects. Insects have also moved forward, but they've moved forward more than the birds have. And so when birds get to their breeding ground, they don't have the food supply or it's there for the beginning of their breeding, breeding cycle, but not the end of their breeding cycle. The insects have, have gone down by then. And so um, it's just another way that climate change is, is a stressor on birds. They don't have the food supply that they're used to. Okay, so what can you do? This is where I want... Oh, I have apologia before I begin. I want you to know that what I know about tree farming is about this much. <laughs> I know nothing about tree farming. When I tried to think about things that you can do, I was thinking about what I know about forests in general and what I know about birds' needs in general. I am not trying to drive everybody bankrupt. I am not trying to make suggestions that are ridiculous. I am hoping that some of my suggestions are things you consider doing. Some of them may not be possible, okay? Because I don't know. It's not that I don't care <laughs> or callous. It's that I honestly don't know what you can do or not do. And I'd love some feedback on that. I would love to hear from some of you. Uh, on my handouts, you've got uh, my email address. I have two handouts that show birds that prefer different types of uh, ground cover and trees and also birds that prefer different uh, age trees. Just to, I thought you might find that interesting. This is my other bird that's not, not local, um, but I like the picture. Um, so anyway, what can you do? Well, let me start off really generally. You can do the same thing everybody else can. And the first thing is, is to think about climate change when you vote. Factor it in the way you factor in other things, you know, because ultimately it's going to be uh, big government policies that, that, that have a lot to do with how much less carbon we put into the atmosphere, aren't they? Those are local. Um, you can also do your best to reduce your own carbon footprint. There are all sorts of things you can do. Anybody who wants it, I have a list of a 100 things the average person can do to a lot of very small things to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, these are the kind of things anybody can do. Reduce food waste, use less gas and electricity, you know, uh, try to recycle rather than use landfills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, when I, one of the groups, the kind of groups I talk to all the time are garden clubs. And so when I think about people planting things in the outdoors, uh, the way I've conceptualized it is there's six general strategies uh, that you can do to make your habitat more bird friendly. Three of them involve providing bird things, birds things, and that's you provide them with food, you provide them with water, you provide them with shelter, and then you protect them from three things. You protect them from predators, from window strikes, which isn't relevant in a tree forest context, and toxins. Okay? So these are the general kinds of things you can do. But 
there's one thing you can do that does four of those six all by itself, and that's plant native plants. I can't say enough about native natural plants. They provide food, they provide shelter, they provide protection from predators, and you don't generally need to fertilize them or put down a lot of pesticides. So uh, native plants, raw. Um, but here, I, uh, let me talk specifically about the tree farm context. I know I'm running out of time. And I know this is possible because someone else talked about it who knows more than I do about this. Do your best to maintain variety uh, on, uh, on your plot of land. And there's all sorts of variety I'm thinking of. Um, if you want to encourage birds in general and the greatest variety of birds and help each bird the most, um, then plant lots of different types of trees. Um, you know, certainly conifers and hardwoods. Um, the more variety, the more food sources there'll be uh, for the birds. You also want to have trees of different ages or sizes. Um, there, there are some birds, as I was talking about the downy woodpecker, that like saplings. There are others that like medium-sized trees. There are others that like really giant trees. So, you know, leave some big trees if you can. Canopy gaps are a good thing. Uh, you might selectively take a piece of the forest that you're letting still grow larger uh, and cut a tree down to have a canopy gap. Canopy gaps let sunlight hit the forest floor and encourages growth uh, of the understory. And that's very good for birds. Most people who don't know birds think of birds up in the trees or up in the sky. There are a lot of birds that live on the ground or live on in bushes, you know, shoulder height. Uh, and so you want a good understory. Healthy understory. There you go. Retain snags. I have three in my yard. Um, snags are larders for birds. When a snag is a standing dead tree, let a tree die and let it stand. As the wood becomes soft and rots, uh, cavity nesters can now build nests in those trees. Plus, they attract insects like mad. And insect eating birds, go for it. They are the most popular bird trees in my yard. Remove invasives, as we talked about before. Invasives aren't as good as, as our native plants are. Leave some down logs. Just leave some logs on the ground. You probably do that anyway, at least pieces of logs. They provide good hiding places for birds. Insects like and, and, and spiders like to get under them. Um, and they're great habitat for things like pack wrens. Similarly, create brush, brush piles. And you can, as you remove invasives, just leave a pile of them. Um, uh, again, provides food, provides shelter, uh, gives them a place to escape, escape storms. Brush piles are terrific. Similarly with rock piles. Rock piles tend to gather leaf litter. There are a lot of birds that make their living by scratching around leaf litter. Someone else talked about this, but rather than just stop where you cut, feather the edges. Feather the edges. So go from unthinned forest to 25% to 50% to 75% gone. It creates a, a nice variety of habitat. It creates a very natural habitat and is very good for birds. Get the, ah, uh, provide or leave water sources. Now I understand that that's not, that that's easier said than done uh, from what people said, but they don't have to be ponds for birds. Uh, they can be much smaller. Things. Again, during breeding season, birds make 200 trips a day to a water source. Um, and so I always tell people, to see, if you're only going to do one thing to attract birds, put down some water. It's the single best thing you can do. Um, here's where you're going to now start hissing at me, but I have to say it. To the extent that you can, avoid your noisiest work during the breeding season. When is the breeding season, you ask? Well, it's really long. <laughs> it's really long. Um, actually early February all the way through late August. But if I was going to skip any point, the most important time to try to avoid cutting and that kind of really disruptive work is April through June. If you could give up two months, those would be the two months. If you can give up two weeks, those would be the time frame I would do it. Um, leave a buffer when you do noisy work. I'm going to skip this. Maintain corridors where you can. I'm sorry, I've run out of time. Um, this is bad because there are a lot of birds that will never leave tree cover. Okay, so there's a lot of forest there, but it's in little patches. I'm going to skip that. Prevent poisoning, reduce use of poison. 
skipping all this because I've run out of time. Anyway, I'm sorry I went over, but you are what hope looks like to a bird. There's a lot that you can do uh, to help them bounce back and deal with the stresses of climate change, and I hope you do some of it. Thank you.